Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us at the 2020 International Online Theatre Festival hosted by the Theatre Times. Uh, my name is Alma. I'm a prelic. I'm one of the, the co-artistic directors of the festival. And I just wanted to say on behalf of the, the curatorial team that we hope that you and yours are staying safe and well, um, understanding, of course, that those are relative terms in these very complicated times. It's been um, absolutely, it's been very moving to see over the past few weeks as the festival has been live, so many people uh, tuning in to watch what we've been screening from all over the world as you're joining us now today from different points, I'm sure. And um, one of the highlights of the 2020 festival program that uh, we curated was a collaboration with Stanislavski Electro Theatre and this Collaboration led us to be able to screen five of their productions, three of which are actually still available online on the festival website. So, so do have a look at those um, if you can. And this for a limited time only, so, so do check them out while they're still available. So today we're going to be having a discussion about the Stanislavski Electro Theatre and more broadly about uh, Russian drama over the course of the 20th century. And with us here we have Noah Berkson Green. Hello, Noah. Um, Hi there. <laughs> He's an, um, who's an academic, a translator, a theater practitioner, a director based at the University of Oxford. And he'll be leading a Q&A with our special guest, John Friedman. Uh, John has had a long standing relationship with the Stanislavski Electro Theater as we're going to go on to discuss today. And he's also a, a prolific writer and, and critic and translator, worked for 25 years as a theater critic for the, for the Moscow Times. So we're absolutely thrilled to have both of them here with us today. Um, if there's time at the end of this, uh, we would hope to be able to open up the, the forum for, for questions. So in the meantime, if you have anything that you would like to ask, please send me a private message at the, um, at the Theater Times, uh, this, this account that's hosting, and I'll, uh, I'll add those to the list at the end. All right, well, thank you very much. And I think that's all I'm going to say for now. Over to you, Noah. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, it's so nice to be talking to you again, John. Uh, we've met a number of times at theatre festivals and, and lovely to sort of manage to keep up that dialogue in spite of all. We've met in lots of different places, Noah. This is the first time I think we've done Zoom, so. I know. <laughs> nice to try something new. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to ask you, obviously, lots of questions about the Electro Theatre. Um, about the current artistic director and, and make sure not to miss out and ask you about your role there. Sure. I would say 2013 was quite a surprising year in Russian theatre. Um, so it contrasted in some ways to national politics. It was uh, Putin had just been re-elected a year earlier uh, for his third presidential term. The politics could be characterised as being ultra-conservative um, even beyond the authoritarian tendencies of the previous um, more than decade. And many people will remember um, legislation that came in that hit the international news headlines, um, the you know, law against advocating for, or as they put it, propagandizing LGBT um, themes and identities to minors. Um, making it an offence to, um, uh, or punishable to offend religious belief, um, sort of a thought crime, if you like. Um, so by 2013, the often when new artistic directors come into theatres with set companies, uh, they often come in and fire half of the company. Boris came in and told everybody that they all had jobs. No one was leaving. There was going to be one, uh, one hitch that there would, they would not be performing live for two years. Uh, he sent them out. He sent the, everybody out on double vacations with double pay. And while everybody was gone over the summer of 2013, he very quickly rebuilt all of the rehearsal rooms and all of the dressing rooms so that when all of the actors returned in the fall of 2013, they came back to seven rehearsal halls where they could all work and dressing rooms that were all beautifully redone. 
And so they had a place to, to rest. They had a, a canteen where they could eat and they had rehearsal halls where they could rehearse. And he set everybody rehearsing, brought in, uh, uh, he started rehearsing. He brought in uh, some of his other friends uh, uh, from the Vasilev school to start rehearsing. He brought in uh, major European directors, Heiner Goebbels, uh, Romeo Castellucci, um, uh, Theodor Terzopoulos from Greece, uh, and they began rehearsing. And so this place was, it was not performing, uh, but it was an absolute beehive of activity. And uh, he was planning to open in uh, January of 2015. And uh, I went in still at that time in, in uh, November or December of uh, 2014, I went into the theater still as the Moscow Times theater critic and to do an interview with Boris because I wanted to run a piece before they opened and then run a piece after they opened. I, it was that big of an event. Um, and I haven't gotten to uh, another big reason why it was an event, so just kind of hold that off over here and I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, and I was, I, was, I was knocked out. I mean, this, he had completely torn everything out of the old theater uh, that was of no value. Every brick, uh, every step on a stairwell, that had any historical value had been rebuffed, reshined, lights set on it. Uh, everything was done in a beautiful way, um, but he just completely gutted the stage uh, and the, the the hall and turned it into a transformer stage. We can you can watch from one end, you can watch from the other. You can have seat seats along the walls. You can have seats at the ends and both ends. One end you can do anything you want in this this place now. And um, it, uh, uh, it was technologically extraordinary. I'm not even going to start to go into all of the stuff he brought in, uh, all of the, uh, the technological stuff. It became a world-class theater in a matter of a year and a half, almost two years. And um, uh, this was all done together with a, a famous Russian um, uh, architectural company called Wow House. I'm sorry, not Wow House, of course. Uh, they quoted in their name. They called themselves Wow House. Uh, and uh, they, they just did a spectacular job of, of remaking the theater. Um, now, I want to come back to that little thing that I put up here and pull it down and, and, and discuss just for a few minutes. What did it mean for Boris Yukhananov to come in, win this competition, and take over one of the central, physically central theaters in Moscow. It's right smack dab off, off of uh, Pushkin Square, right in the middle of Moscow. Um, Boris Yukhananov was a very hard guy to catch for about 25 or 30 years. He was an underground director who did his own thing in St. Petersburg, or he might go to Riga and do a production he, he did a couple of productions that got quite a bit of uh, attention from critics uh, ba uh, based on uh, Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard. He called it the garden uh, rather than the orchard because the, the point of the, the Garden of Eden was very important to this production. So we call it the garden as opposed to calling it the orchard. Um, and he did it in regenerations. Once every two or three years, he would regenerate the show and play it for a couple of times. But I mean, these were not shows that were in rep. These were not shows you could go see, you know, every day. You can go see Lev Dodin stuff all you want. You can see Kamaginkas, you can see Konstantin Reichen, you can see anybody you want. Uh, Boris, you, you, is Yuchan on the plan? I don't know, it's been a couple of months. Uh, I don't know, does, is he doing anything? Well, he's always doing something, but I don't know what he's doing now. Um, he lived his extremely active, fruitful, uh, and uh, uh, important life in art out of the eye of the mainstream. He was very much underground. And so when this guy from the underground was handed on a platter one of the major theater playhouses in Moscow, and uh, it was an astonishing thing. And as I said, Boris did not remake this theater in his own image, because if he'd remade it in his own image, he would have turned it into an incredibly hot, but underground, unusual, 
you know, strange theater that would have bucked the mainstream. And uh, one of his favorite, one of his favorite things when he was, uh, uh, I was talking to me, I talked to him a lot. I, I loved, I've always ta loved talking to Boris. Boris is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And so it's, he's an extremely entertaining uh, interlocutor. And he loved telling me about a, a project that he wanted to do someday called Terrorist Theater, in which he and a bunch of group of his, his, uh, his, his actors would run into some theater, the Moscow Art Theater, let's say, and they would run up on stage in the middle of some boring Moscow art theater show, and they would start doing something for three or four minutes before anybody could figure it out. And then they would run out of the theater before anybody could arrest them or grab them or do anything to them. And they would have brought life into the Moscow art theater and everybody, you know, the, the audience would be buzzing, the actors on stage would be angry and buzzing, and everybody would be buzzing. And life would have happened in the Moscow art theater, thanks to this terrorist theater that Boris Yukonov used to think about. He never did it. He didn't have to. All he had to do was enough for him to talk about it uh, for something like that to make its point. Um, but I think it's important to, to, to bring up the, the, the fact that this, this very unusual, uh, uh, very powerful artist uh, was from that part of the creative spectrum. And now he's got this theater with a uh, hundred actors and, you know, a huge team. Uh, lighting people, and, you know, it's, he's, he's running a, a typical normal theater. And he immediately set out doing it differently. His first show that he opened uh, was uh, actually even before the theater opened. Uh, uh, Romeo Castellucci uh, opened uh, a, a show, uh, even before the theater actually opened. And then the, then the theater opened with, uh, officially opened with production by Ter, uh, Terzopoulos. Within a few months, they had their third show, Gebbels, uh, Max Black, uh, up and running. I want to point out another thing uh, that's really important to understand about Russian theater and why what Boris did is, is unusual and important. Everybody knows that Russian theaters are despotic, uh, are run by despotic directors. That's, it's, it's part of the, the tradition. Uh, Everybody knows that Russian directors are jealous as hell of other directors. Uh, it, uh, I remember talking once to Roman Kozak, uh, uh, another uh, Moscow director, and he was talking about letting Declan Donnellan come in and do something on his stage. It was when he was just starting to run the Puchkin. And I said, wow, Roman, I said, that's a great idea. And he says, you think so? And I said, well, of course it's a great idea. I said, you know, you, you, everything that Donnellan brings to the theater, that accrues to you. You're the guy that invited him. You're the guy that runs the theater. So all of his success accrues to you. And if it's not a success, you didn't do it. It's, I said, it's, 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 it's wonderful. And he goes, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He did it. Uh, he uh, uh, ended up inviting Donnellan and it worked well. But the point is that Russian directors are not good at bringing in other directors into their space. Boris Yukonov took over this new theater, started to do it in a whole, he gutted it, redid it, started doing it in a whole other way, and opened it with productions by a guy from Greece and by uh, a, a guy from Italy and a guy from uh, uh, Belgium. And it was, you know, that was, that was an incredible statement, which allows me to come back to, and I'm going to wrap this little uh, monologue up here in a minute, but it comes back to your point about the politics of the time, because this indeed was a period when Russia was beginning to close down again. I mean, we've, we've now reached 2020 and, you know, Russia is almost under lock and key. It's, uh, uh, the difficulties there are enormous. But uh, it was just beginning when Putin returned as, as president for the third, third time. And it was just beginning to close down and, and notions of of, you know, oh, do we really need Europe? And, you know, the, 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 the lovely phrase that, that the Russian idiots love to use, gay ropa. We don't need gay ropa, uh, meaning Europe, uh, and, and that kind of thing. And Boris opened up his theater by, by saying, you know, I've got a guy from Italy, I've got a guy from Greece, and I've got a guy from Belgium. I'm part of the world. The world is part of us. We're all in this thing together, and we're going to, from here on out, we're going to work together. And it was, uh, uh, it, it was a, an amazing thing, actually. Within within uh, uh, nine months, I had I'd left my job where I was, and I I went to work for Boris. Yeah. 
Amazing. <clears throat> Thank you. So you, you brought up the theme of the kind of um, the, the vision he brought to the theatre and one of the two things was this notion of being a European theatre as, as you've already spoken about. Um, and the other thing um, was he was talking about going back to the spirit of the original theatre under Stanislavski, uh, the opera and, and drama studio, um, breaking down that notion of opera and, and drama as two separate uh, artistic genres and looking at, um, at them as something which uh, enrich each other and, and confuse together. Um, perhaps you could, you know, partly say a little bit about that. Um, yeah, there's, there's but also, a, there's, uh -huh. yeah. Oh, sorry, just also um, sort of, in a way, why it matters in the Russian theatre landscape. Um, you know, are there other theatres doing this or, or is this really quite uh, unique the way it's happening? Um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, it's an interesting historical thing that uh, Stanislavski worked at this actual plant where the uh, Stanislavski Electric Theatre is now located. He, he ran his opera and, and drama studio out of out of this place for a short while not long but he was there historically speaking Stanislavski was there it's one of the reasons it's the reason why the theater was called the Stanislavski drama theater in the past it's uh, the reason why Boris kept Stanislavski in the name of the theater when he took it over calling it the Stanislavski Electra theater and briefly I will just say that the re why Electro Theater, well, it's basically two reasons. First of all, you know, Electro Theater is just kind of cool sounding. Sounds like a place that's quite electric, you know. Um, but even historically speaking, uh, that's what movie theaters were called when they first came out in the, in the, the second decade of the 20th century. They were called Electro Theaters in, in Russia. So, and, and there was an Ars Electro Theater, an Ars movie house. Uh, in this place. So it, it was just going back to the original name of the Electro Theater, uh, as well as the idea of electrifying Moscow theater. But the notion of, of uh, carrying on, so to speak, something that Stanislavski had wanted to do, which was to bring drama and opera together, has turned out to be an extremely important aspect in the, in the work at, at the uh, Electro Theater. And um, uh, I've got some some figures here which are pretty impressive. Um, the, the most important one I'm interested in right now is the 13 contemporary operas that the Stanislavski uh, uh, that the uh, Stanislavski Electro Theater has commissioned and, and staged. But I want to put that in a in a certain context too. In the first five years of the theater's existence, from January uh, um, uh, of 20. Uh, 2015, January 2015 until January 2020, uh, the Electro Theater produced 57 new productions. We've had several since, but I'm, I'm just taking the numbers from those five years. There were 20 debuts. Uh, that's another thing which is astonishing. Uh, uh, young directors getting an opportunity to work in Russian theater is, is everybody knows that the hill, that hill, climbing that hill is virtually impossible. Uh, directors end up being called young directors and new directors until they're 40 and 45 years because they just can't, they can, you know, they might get one, they might get two, but they really, they, they really don't get an opportunity to work. Boris has turned out, he built, a, he had a new stage, a brand new new stage built, and he turned it over to all of his students. And he is, his students have been producing uh, debuts and new shows and second shows and third shows there ever since. Um, another thing that he did uh, is, and this goes back, I've never, heard any, I've never heard anybody talk about this, but to me it's important because my own research in the old days when I was in a different, I wore a different hat and I was a scholar, uh, I, I wrote about uh, Mayerhold and the Mayerhold, uh, uh, people who worked with Mayerhold. And one of the things that Mayerhold did uh, in the uh, late, right after the revolution in the early 20s, is he included a, an educational program along with everything that he did. And he had, he had lectures and speeches, and they had classes and everything. Well, uh, uh, Yuhananov uh, uh, got uh, hired a woman who was one of the best Russian critics, uh, Kristina Matvienka. And he asked her to uh, put together a thing called the, it was at the beginning, it was called the Electro Zone. Uh, and then most often we now call it the School of Contemporary Spectators and Listeners. But this program, if you, if you go to the, 
the theater website and you look and you see the events that go on at the theater uh, virtually, virtually every day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the, of the season, there's an astonishing amount of activity going on with, with scholars lecturing, with actors doing master classes, with historians digging up stuff and, and bringing in uh, new information, authors coming in and presenting their books, um, actors doing uh, poetry readings or singing that gets an op gives them an opportunity to do different things with what they do when they're usually on stage. There have been something like three or 400 in the five years that the theater has existed now. There have been something like three to 400 of these events uh, that go on in the foyer, sometimes on the stage, small stage, sometimes on the big stage, sometimes in the, the, the coat check area, sometimes in, on the stairwell. Uh, the whole space has been turned into a place for human beings and theater and ideas and thought, and knowledge, and art. And uh, it's a pretty amazing place to walk around when all of this stuff is going on. There's a rehearsal in one hall, a rehearsal in another, and there's a, there's a conference going on, on on one level, and there's a talk about a, about a new book uh, up in the foyer. And it's, it's really pretty amazing. So that's the context for all of the stuff that is going on, aside from just productions being staged, uh, is the 13, are the 13 operas, contemporary operas that have been commissioned from living. And when I say they're living, <laughs> these guys, all of these guys are younger than you and I are, uh, Noah. I mean, these guys, uh, they're, you know, they're brand new babies coming up and they're being, they're having stuff commissioned. They're getting their works done. They're winning awards. They're winning awards in Europe. Um, your, uh, uh, the Stanislavski Electra Theater work with contemporary opera has yet to be uh, understood fully. I, I, I have a feeling that down the road, uh, whether it's 10 years or 30 years, if we're lucky to make it that far, uh, when people look back, uh, this will be one of the most extraordinary um, efforts on the part of a, a Russian theater to mix genres, change, change genres. Uh, uh, you don't get, the, the Bolshoi doesn't, the Bolshoi doesn't commission 13 con, uh, contemporary operas from contemporary writers in a, in a five-year period. If they do one in a five, if they do one in a 10-year period, that's doing pretty good. And in, for the most part, when they do do it, the Bolshoi does do it, or the Nemiroj Danchenko uh, Musical Theater does do it, they will, they will commission from a very well-known composer that everybody, yes, 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 this person definitely deserves to have a, his new opera produced somewhere. Then Stanislavski Opera Theater goes out and finds young kids that are writing in a way that nobody else is, doing things that nobody else is doing. They turn them, they, they, they say, here's the stage, go to work, uh, bring us some new work. And it's, this is all being done under the tutelage. This is very important because this guy is one of the great men of contemporary Russian theater in my, in my uh, opinion, Dmitry Kurlyansky, who is the musical director. He is a composer himself. Uh, uh, he is the one who has been in charge of finding uh, these composers, encouraging them, uh, getting them to do new shows. Uh, he's, there have been a, a couple of his uh, operas staged, but he does, his job is not to sit there. He didn't find a nice little chair that he could sit down. Ah, oh, now I get to do all of the operas I've always wanted to do because I have a place I can do it. That's not what he's done at all. He's, he's, he's taking part, but he's basically opening his arms wide open, flinging the doors of the theater open and saying, you know, we're going to do this new thing. We're going to, you know, theater began, it, it, theater and music were together at the beginning. Theater and music went different ways. They came back together again over history. Uh, then there's this lovely little moment where you have Stanislavski in this very building, building working with a, an opera and drama uh, studio. And now the, it's, it's come to this moment in, in historical time where this incredible drama theater 
is doing spectacular opera work as well. It is not Verdi. It is not the operas you think, <laughs> when you hear the word opera, this is not what you're used. This is not La Scala. This is contemporary opera. It is very, very, very different. It has a lot of, there's a lot of dramatic theater in it. There's a lot of installation in it. In fact, one of the operas that was, uh, was actually composed by Kurliansky, uh, directed by uh, Yuhananov, um, uh, it's, it's actually been showing, or it might be shown, Octavia Tre Trepanation uh, in this festival. Uh, it's part installation, part uh, fashion show, part opera, part drama, part historical. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's fabulous stuff, very unusual stuff. So this is, this is really, really um, one of the most important uh, parts of the theater is its work with contemporary opera. Thank you, that's fantastic. Um, I was wondering, this, this question is maybe a little bit more for those without the specialist knowledge, but I think still you know, really of interest to, to scholars of, of Russian theatre. Um, just to think about cultural difference and um, what, what a director stands for in Russia. Um, you know, perhaps there's a, a dominant sense in Britain of the director as interpreter, still completely creative, but someone interpreting a text. Um, and in Russia, it's sort of generally particularly those top directors tend to think of themselves as pedagogues as well as philosophers um perhaps poets sometimes as well and authors um and i mean even just sort of going, going looking on youtube today and just uh, finding a few interviews with with uh boris yukhananov um you know some fascinating things like he, that, that anyone can hear him saying he's in one video sort of uh, constructively but nevertheless berating a young a young uh, i think as a film film director and uh, sort of warning him off television saying that's satan um he talks about you know that the director is is the one who finds the inner poetic life of of people um can you say i mean i potentially a little bit broadly about russian directors but of course about uh boris as well um yeah. sort of how he sees himself as a director what, what that means to be a theater director in in russia and, and for him well, I think it's important to say right off is that when Boris uh, took this job on, he immediately announced that this theater will be a director's theater. It was very important for him. And in fact, it, it creates problems for me as the translator of, of everything that is produced, all text that is produced in the theater, I translate at one point or another. Um, and it creates problems because the, the tradition in the U.S. is to say Anton Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard as directed by, you know, Joe Blow. Um, and uh, at our theater in Russian, in any case, they write, they write. Joe Blow's The Cherry Orchard uh, staged it according to a text by Anton Chekhov. And it's, so when you, they, you know, the, the, the attitude immediately in this theater is a director centric. Russian theater in general is director centric. I mean, uh, you actually, in your little talk here just a few minutes ago, you did a very good job of, of laying that out. That, uh, uh, and if you go back in, in history, you know, Stanislavski, I don't have to say anything more. Meyerhold, I don't have to say anything more. Yuri Lubimov, I probably don't have to say anything more. Those are names of great Russian directors who, uh, you know, changed the course of the, the theater, world theater. Uh, in which they work. And uh, Boris uh, Yukhananov, as a student of Anatoly Vasilyev and another great Russian director of the time, Anatoly Efros, he is uh, very much in uh, the, the tradition of a strong Russian director, as you said, a philosopher, as, as the one who is searching, searching for the human soul in the actor and in, in the character. Yeah. Very much so. I mean, that sounds very much like Yukonomic to me. Um, <coughs> it is uh, uh, always a theater that is corresponding to the vision of the director. Always. Uh, I'm talking about Stanislavski Electric Theater now. But I could also actually be talking about uh, Russian theater in general. There have been a few theaters here and there. Most recently, the probably the most famous one was Theater Doc, uh, which was a play, which was a, a, write, uh, a theater for writers. 
But even there, you know, when you go back over the best productions that were done at Theater Dock, uh, those were Russians that were staging those shows, and they were very strong directorial viewpoints. Mikhail Ugarov, who was a writer uh, and is the one who proclaimed the theater uh, a, 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 a writer's theater, his uh, productions were very strong in, in, in terms of the, the direction. Um, I could go on and on, but that's getting off into another topic. I just want to point out that even a writer's theater, a self-proclaimed writer's theater recently in Russia, was also, also had very strong directorial uh, uh, work. Um, that, is the, that is the system, that is the tradition. Um, a, a little, a tiny little story, I remember uh, sitting in the theater union back in the early 1990s and everybody hated everything at the time and everybody said everything was bad and there was nothing good and there were no writers and there were no no new directors and everything was dead and everything was awful and i was just a you know bright-eyed kid from the united states sitting there like in this this luxury of incredible theater all around with, with good writers and great directors and wonderful actors and a, a woman, I, I said to a woman, the woman that was telling me how, how terrible everything was, you know, I, I said to her, I said, well, you know, I, I don't quite agree with that. I think there's, uh, there's quite a few interesting directors right now working. And before I could start naming somebody and saying something, she was, oh, she says, there's no directors. She says, we Russians, we expect mayor hold every time we go to the theater. Well, yeah, they, they, there's something to that. They do, they do expect mayor hold every time they go to the theater, many of them anyway. Uh, maybe things are changing a little bit, but I don't think that much. I think that in terms of an anecdote, it's still a, it's still a useful anecdote. It's still, it kind of gives the temperature of the place uh, that, you know, there are people who never saw, you know, the, the, that's an important thing to remember. A woman who had never seen <laughs> Mayor Hold Productions, she wasn't that old. And she was sitting here telling me, you know, uh, oh, there's no good directors. We expect Mayor Hold every time we go to the theater. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, Boris is very much in that, uh, 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 that tradition. He's a, he is a strong director with a very strong vision um, of what he wants to do. And uh, one of the things that I think is so fascinating about him, he's always been like this. And this is the one thing that he's carried over into his new life, if you will, is, is the, the, the head of a, of a popular, important, mainstream, um, yet cutting edge theater is that he loves big. Boris loves big. He did a film once, he did a, a, a video film that uh, was called The Mad Prince in 1,000 cassettes. Cassettes went, went, ran what, four hours long. So you hear 4,000, 4, this film that he did called The Mad Prince ran 4,000 hours. Uh, he often does shows that run two, three, four days. Uh, Several of his shows, uh, The Blue Bird, uh, based on Metterlink and Russian history, late uh, recent uh, Russian and Soviet history, runs three days. Uh, Drillalians, which is one of the, the operas, it's a spectacular uh, five-day piece written by six different composers um, that, as I say, runs over five days. It's a six-part piece that runs over five days. Many of his shows run two, three days. He loves big. He's, he, he has a, a knack for just pulling off incredibly big things. Um, and uh, it's obviously, it's not just a matter of size, uh, but I don't see any other director in the world. I don't see any other director in the world and I'm, if I'm missing something, if there's somebody on here and, and you can tell me about them, I'd love to hear it. But I personally don't see any other director in the world that has this, this sense of scope, this sense of, of, of hugeness that he brings to his art. And um, uh, only a director, I mean, only a strong director can do something like that. You know, this, this isn't, you know, just playing around with actors' improvisations or uh, something. This is, you know, you've got to have a vision to come in and say, I'm going to do a five-day show of six operas or a three-day show turning a, a children's play, Metterlinks, The Bluebird, turning it into a three-day uh, uh, explication of, of recent Soviet history uh, and, 
and uh, the, the life of the two main actors in the theater. It's a beautiful uh, combination of children's theater and a very, very difficult uh, historical uh, uh, work. So uh, I, don't, um, I, I, I don't know how, how clearly I, I answered your question about directors in, in the Russian tradition, but yeah, the Russian tradition is, I, I'll just, let's, let me just go back to this. Uh, I often talk to Americans who are horrified to hear that Russians don't allow the writer in the rehearsal hall when they are staging a new play. Um, and if there's any Americans listening right now, they're probably grabbing their hair. Not, but it's not only do the Rus Russian directors not let the writers into the hall. They tell them to keep their asses away until after the premiere. You have nothing to do here until I open my show because the show is the directors in Russia. It is not the playwright. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you can, you know, that can be argued until we're all blue in the face. But that's the way. You know, that's Thank the way. you. Um, I have... I could talk about this all day with you and I have lots of questions, but I want to give a chance to other people. They've asked some questions. We still have 15 minutes. I think what I will do is just mention that you have written a brilliant article, uh, which addresses other subjects that we probably won't necessarily get onto right now. Um, and it is called Boris Yukonanov in space and time. It's a, I mean, you can just Google it and find it. it's in the core uh, the sonographer journal from 2019. Maybe when you're answering these questions, I can pop it onto the group chat to everyone. So in case anyone wants to follow up on it, they can take that, that, that search term and just put it in Google and read your article and they'll find much more information about specific productions and, and, and more about what you've spoken about here. So I don't have to feel uh, worried that I didn't get to sort of mention certain things or ask you to mention certain things. But let me um, ask, t tell you what question, which questions have come in so we can give the viewers a chance to have their um, questions asked and I'll do what I'll do is I'll ask you three in one go and then you can uh, sort of address those I'm sure in the time we've got so the first one is um, does Putin watch the Stanislavski Electro Theatre? No. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> it is an interesting question, actually. I have to stop myself. I'll come questions. back to it, but no. <laughs> but, uh, Oleg Tabakov, the former director of the Moscow Arts Theatre, once said, I am a, I am a civil servant. Uh, he said it tongue in cheek, but of course, as you said, they are appointed by the government. So it's an interesting question about how an artistic director finds freedom, I suppose, from the authorities. But in any case, second question, um, how was the filming process? They are beautifully shot. Somebody says, I'm sorry, I don't know the, I don't know the names, forgive me for that. And the third question, uh, what is the Electro Theatre's relationship to other major theatres of Moscow, the Moscow Arts, um, Moscow Arts Theatre, the Gogol Centre, the School of Dramatic Arts, etc.? Uh, does Putin watch the Electro Theatre? I doubt that very seriously. Um, if, if we're talking about that strictly as a, as a question as posed. Um, in the 25 years that I covered Russian theater, I saw, I saw Putin in theaters twice. Uh, one was the Sevdomenik, um, and the other was uh, Konstantin Reichen's Styrikon. He showed up for uh, Konstantin Reichen's 60th birthday party, and the other one was, was for uh, Volchik, Galina Volchik, who was the artistic director of the Sevdomenik Theater. It was for one of her jubilee, jubilee uh, uh, productions. So Putin tends to show up at the theater when there's, you know, somebody is to be honored. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen in the near future at the, the Electro Theater. If, if we were to veer off into your question, your interpretation of the question as Tabakov saying I'm a civil servant, um, uh, <laughs> Boris Yukonanov is the kind of guy that whatever I would say he would do, if he were to show up, he would then just do the opposite, of course. So um, uh, I don't want to try to I don't want to try to speak for Boris, but I want to try to answer your question in 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 terms of Yukonanov. I don't think Yukonanov sees himself as a civil servant at all. Uh, uh, Yukonanov sees himself uh, strictly and for, first and foremost as an artist as someone who is, has been given the responsibility and the privilege 
to push the what is really one of the great theaters of the world forward, meaning Russian theater. Um, uh, Boris uh, tends to be very bored by and tends to be very skeptical about uh, uh, you know political kind of stuff, although many of his productions are filled with very, very cutting political commentary. So you don't want to draw any uh, simple conclusions based on this. You know, if you read an interview with Boris or if you talk to Boris, you know, he may say, he may poo poo politics in theater and he may say, you know, it's not, that's not of any interest. That's, that's, uh, you know, it's worthless, but watch his shows and then, and then draw your conclusion is what I would say. So uh, that's a brief answer seeing as how we're running out of time. That's a kind of a brief answer to, to your interpretation of the question. Uh, the filming process, re I'm really happy that question was asked uh, because that's one of the, another <laughs> one of the incredible things that is done at the, uh, at the Electro Theater. All of Boris Yukonanov's own productions, all of them are filmed with six cameras. Uh, at the dress rehearsal the, before the opening. They are all done professionally by six professional cameramen. They have, a, you know, they have directors and everybody running around making sure the camera's in the right place, getting the right shots. And so the show has not yet opened, and, but the material is already going down into the basement film studio that we have to be cut and and the montage to be done uh this text will then come to me soon and i do uh, uh subtitles so relatively shortly after a show one of the yukonana shows and and it's not only the yukonana shows a couple of the others have been filmed as well you've, you've seen them um on this uh this festival but uh uh, the show is barely opening and we're already getting very close to having a complete film. I mean, it will still take another month or two usually. If it's a six day, actually, if it is a 33 part production, like uh, Orf uh, Orphic Games. Orphic Games was a six day, 33 part production. That was a monstrous, monstrous show that took me a long time, I must say, to translate. And I was the last one done. Everybody else was done with their work, and I, my tongue was hanging out, and I was still working on the translation of the text. But uh, the filming is very important uh, to the theater. It's very important to Boris. Boris has always filmed all of his work. He has been a film director throughout his career, not only a, th a theater director, but also a film director. He was one of the founders of uh, what is called Parallel Cinema, uh, in the, the late <coughs> the late eighties, which was a, a kind of a response to uh, official uh, Soviet kind of uh, film, it was uh, all experimental, avant-garde, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, underground. Um, so yeah, the filming process is very important to us, and and they do a really good job. Um, now, what is the relation to other theaters and a few other theaters were named? I don't think there's, I mean, there's, the, of course, there's a relationship between the, the theater and all other theaters. Um, as there is, you know, as there is in the Aegean Sea, which is right outside my window, and there's fish swimming around, and all of those fish are swimming around in their own schools, and they're all in the same sea, and they're all kind of in the same place, but they're taking care of their own business. I think that's true of Google Center. Uh, when Serebrenikov was in trouble, Yukonanov was one of the first people to come out and speak out against it. Uh, the theater held uh, events, bringing attention to the fact that uh, Serebrenikov was in trouble. Um, uh, his films were, were showed at our, uh, were, were screened at our theater to bring attention to what was going on there. Um, there is, of course, a connection of sorts to the School of Dramatic Art because that's where Boris uh, studied uh, under Vasiliev and, and Boris worked there for many years um, uh, until he got the, the position at the Electro Theater. But, uh, and, and a couple of the actors from the School of Dramatic Arts have come over and, and now work at the, the Electro Theater. But I, I, there aren't any joint productions uh, between the two theaters. There isn't anything like that. Uh, 
um, the Theater of Nations, which is another uh, cutting edge theater in Moscow. We, we know what they're doing. They know what we're doing. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like you walking by each other on the square and you, hey, how are you doing today, guys? Everything good? Good? Good to hear it. You know, good luck. Keep it up. And, and, and you go on your way and you do your own thing. Um, uh, that's the way I would characterize it. Um, somebody else might characterize it differently, but that's how I see it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we've got just a couple of minutes for two final questions, one from the audience member and one from me, um, before I hand back to, to Alma. Um, but to the, well, one question from our viewers is, um, what financial support the theatre gets today from the state, from the city, from private sponsors? And um, I mean, it's, it's a brief one from me, but just to acknowledge, obviously, the times we live in with uh, COVID-19, sort of, is, is the theatre, you know, have, well, what is the state of the theatre is in? Is it, uh, are they still rehearsing a production to be prepared for when, when the lockdown ends? Are they temporarily, temporarily on pause or just, just sort of maybe a word about how the theatre is affected? Right. The financial support of the theatre, the theatre is very fortunate. And the theatre is fortunate because of Boris Yukonanov's forward thinking. <laughs> uh, Yukonanov, in addition to being uh, a somewhat obscure underground artist, uh, has always had a very, very good business sense. And he has always uh, uh, had connections with people uh, who have money to give. Uh, and he had, as I said, he had a sponsor that put up 25 million to redo the theater when we did it. That, that, that sponsor continues to give money to the theater regularly to support the theater, to support its productions. It pays for very expensive production. The costumes on Yukonanov's productions alone uh, are outrageously expensive. These are all paid for by the sponsor. The, the city continues to pay what the city usually does pay for most Moscow theaters. So it, it gives them a little bit of money for production, but it really isn't of much use. Um, it pays for you know, the, the, the bookkeepers, it pays for the electricity, it pays for the water, uh, it, it pays for all of those kinds of the utilities and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and of course, the, the, the theater attempts to make money through sales of tickets, um, but it's a very hard thing to do to make to make much money in Russia on ticket sales. Uh, theater is, has always been perceived as a people's art. Uh, 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 it's the art of the people. Uh, it is expected that little old ladies and, and, and li even little old men, Noah, that's, that, that <laughs> refers to us soon, uh, should have the ability and the right to go, you know, and, and see theater no matter what it is. Uh, and so theaters do a, really try to keep ticket prices down. So they, can't, they don't make much off of that. The theater is, lives off a, a combination of a very generous sponsor and the, the, the sponsorship of the city, which sponsors it to the extent that it's, it, it sponsors every other Moscow uh, city-funded theater. As far as your question, uh, COVID-19, what is the theater doing? Uh, the theater is closed. Uh, like all theaters in Moscow, uh, it, it can't perform. Uh, I don't know when they're going to open them back up. I know uh, some areas in Moscow life are supposed to reopen around uh, the 15th of the month. I doubt, I doubt that the theaters will reopen. I can't believe it, that would happen. Um, uh, it may well be that theaters won't reopen until the fall because we're coming up now on the end of the, of the current season. Uh, Moscow, theater season runs September to June to July. So um, my guess, uh, it's not anything more than that, but it's my guess is that for the most part, we will not see any more live theater until fall of this year. Uh, God forbid that there's a second, third, fourth wave by that time. Um, uh, they, I, I know that uh, uh, there's rehearsals going on, mostly by Skype. Uh, mostly by Skype and by Zoom. Uh, uh, I, I, Boris taped a, a, a statement for uh, the Theater Times in which he talked about uh, one of the plays that they're rehearsing right now is uh, they're rehearsing numerous plays about COVID-19, which sounds very much unlike a Boris Yukonanov idea. Boris Yukonanov is not somebody that does uh, headline theater, uh, but obviously even he felt that in this situation, 
that was something that would be of value. And even if what even if the results aren't anything great, uh, it's of importance to do just to do it. Uh, and so those things are going on. Um, I wouldn't expect much more from the theater or from any other Moscow theater until the fall. Yeah. Thanks so much, John. This has been Certainly absolutely much. fascinating. I will hand back to Alma, but uh, thank you. I've enjoyed our conversation so much. Nice chat with you again, Noah. Oh, well, thank you so much, um, both of you, for this absolutely fascinating discussion. I think, um, John, you've, you've given us uh, not only such an incredible overview, but also a very personal and sort of view from within, which is very difficult to get, you know, um, mm. otherwise in the situation other than this kind of conversation, which also thank you so well uh, facilitated by you, Noah. And thank you everyone for, for watching and for your questions, which have, which, which have been coming in throughout the hour. I, um, I also, uh, like John, I'm very pleased that we had this, uh, this query about the filming because, of course, one of the things that we had to keep in mind when we were looking at what we would be able to screen was, was how well it translated. And um, this is not a question of quality. It's just really whether the camera is able to, able to capture the spirit of the production in question. And I think for those of you who've already seen or for those of you who haven't yet, please do, do look because the, the quality or so, the images are just stunning and, and incredibly cinematic in a sense. So they are. I, I'm, I'm not going to take any of your time, except I, I'm continually, see, continuously seeing on Facebook and Twitter people saying, I'm so sick of theater online. I'm so sick of theater on film. And I, I want to say to them, look at the Stanislavski electric, the electro theater stuff, because you will see something very different. It's it, indeed the theater has done it very well. All applause to all of the folks uh, who make the films at the theater. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't take our word for it. Uh, just uh, because you can see so there's still a few more days left to watch these online. So Noah, uh, John, thank you so very much. And thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank Talk you. Bye-bye.